my name is Daniel Greenberg. Today is Friday, July 18th, 2014, and I'm here uh, to uh, uh, ask questions for an oral history for my mother, Susan Barnett. Um, let's see. Uh, where and when were you born? I was born in Rochester, New York, um, in April, April 21st, 1945. Were you born in a hospital or? Sure, I was born in a hospital. They had hospitals then. I don't know which hospital. I'm thinking Highland Hospital. Um, do you know how your family happened to settle in Rochester in the first place? My mother's father came from Russia and he left in 1917, he left Russia, Minsk. He was um, Sam Commissar. Close. And his mother and his wife, Dora, Devera Dora, Commissar. They came from Russia. Mom, I don't know how they settled in Rochester, but there we were. And that's how I happened to be there. My mother was born in 1918 in Rochester. She was born in Rochester. Um, do you know about what uh, your father? Uh, uh, your father's from Minsk also? Or? Uh, they were from Russia, mm -hmm. I think, but many, many generations. My sister Robin was trying to trace when they came over, but it's like way back even in the Civil War there were Barnetts. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were our Barnett, or yeah, mm -hmm. my father's name was Barnett. They don't know if they were our Barnetts, but um, no origin of my father who was Albert Barnett. He didn't used to have middle names. But when he got older, he decided he wanted to have a middle name. So first he chose an initial, and then he chose another initial. He gave a name to um, the first initial. That's kind of interesting. Uh -huh. uh, my father, Albert Barnett, became Albert R. Barnett, and then he thought he wanted R because he thought Regis would be a good middle name. He was a big reader. And then he added V, R, period, V, period, period, Barnett. So that was interesting. My mother was Molly Commissar, Molly Barnett. And I've read, now that I've looked back a little bit, that her name used to be Molly, M-O-L-L-Y, Estelle Barnett. And she changed her name to Molly, M-O-L-L-E-Y, in high school, because she wanted to be not like all the other Mollies. And she changed her middle name to Molly Ellen Barnett, so or Commissar in high school. So I thought that was interesting that we all kind of have this singular. We wanted to make ourselves more unusual compared to our peers in high school. So I'm that way too. So what did your parents do for a living? My father started out, he did writing. He was a writer and he hitchhiked across the country when he was young and wrote articles and then he fell in love with my mother and I'm not sure he went and he took a course. He didn't want to be in the war. I guess that would be the Second World War. So he took a course at Cornell and fell in love with Cornell and worked somewhere I'm not I don't remember where I don't remember a whole lot sorry um, but then he got a job working for uh, George DB Bond Brighton Company two initials again George D period B period Bond Brighton Company a local it was a regional brokerage firm and he was an account one. executive a stockbroker and he did very well there so that was a pivotal point in our family did they train him to become a stockbroker? They trained him, whatever training was, in the old days where they had people walking around erasing the prices of the investments and writing the prices up with chalk. And really? he did well. He, because their whole goal of my parents was to move us. We lived at that time 
when we were little in um, my Zadie's house, which was a four family. He owned a lot, he bought real estate. My Zadie was lucky. I don't know what he did to make money to buy houses and apartments, but he bought, bought real estate in his um, home. He lived downstairs on the left, and we loved, lived upstairs on the right in an apartment, Nobody. of course, no air conditioning, and my father's big goal was to have enough money to move us out of the city of Rochester into Brighton, which was the best school district, because, as with many Jews, education was really important. What do you remember about the neighborhood? You mentioned that you first lived in an apartment. Was that in downtown, or...? We lived in the city, but not downtown. We would take a bus to go actually through downtown, or go downtown to see a movie. When we were little, we would take a bus to go to the movies. They had movie theaters downtown, and uh, we would take the bus to Maine and Clinton, get off, go to Mr. Peanut, and we have a few, our, mo our mother would give us a little bit of money, we would go buy pistachios. Pistachios. And mm -hmm. then we break the pistachio, go to the movie theater, always the mm -hmm. same thing, go to the movie theater, eat mm -hmm. the pistachios, get our fingers red and our faces red, and risk our front teeth cracking them open. That never happened though, did it? Not then, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not then. Uh, and what, what, did your mother work at all? My mother um, wanted to go to college, but she was my... Zadie's, I can't remember, it was a long time ago. Um, she was the last child of my grandparent and she was the girl. My, my bubby wanted a girl. And so they finally had a girl. There was Uncle Sal, there was Uncle Ben, um, there was Uncle... I can't remember my uncle's name. They lived out west. Was that Ivan? on your father's side? Yeah. Uh, no, my mother. Your mother's side. Ivan. Oops. Ivan. Uh huh. Um. What do you remember about your Fabian and Zadie? Um. Memory is always foggy. The um. My grandparents were kind of like they used to have the country cornflake. A couple in ads in uh, TV. They were my grandfather was a stern guy, not skinny like the country cornflake ad. You should look that up. Google it, Daniel. And country cornflake ad. There was a country. I think it was a Kellogg's product, and the uh, they would have a, a man and a woman. The man would be thin. I think he was holding some kind of a pitchfork or something, just or maybe a rake, and the woman had it like a bun. That, it, when I looked at them, or when I saw the country club, like I thought of my Bubby and Zadie. They were very stern, they had a tough childhood, they were Jews in Russia who were being exterminated in the pogroms in 1917. And so they, um, so they, um, weren't giggly happy people. They came to America, they learned English best they could, and like my Bubby, my Zadie was very serious. My Bubby was the one who was the most demonstrative, although not so demonstrative. And the big thing would be when she had some money, we would walk down <laughs> Joseph Avenue and get a jelly donut. That was a big thing. So we would go, you want to get a jelly donut? That's what I remember. They were, and we would go downstairs and there would be soup and just nice things like that. And behind their house, my childhood. Behind their house, they had, it was just a house in the city, and there were um, all these nasty weeds growing, and the kind you would pick, and then you would pull down the little seeds. I didn't know I was reseeding weeds. And then also, I remember in my childhood that my Zadie's house was very old. They didn't have really floors. They had, like, dirt. These were old houses. They had really? dirt in the basement. So this is what I remember, whether it's true or not, but this is what I remember. Uh -huh. So there were little rooms and they would store things down there. Yeah, that's what I remember. And there, I guess they did canning and my, my bubby did can. Oh, and then going to the public market with my bubby on Saturday morning. We'd go to the public market. My bubby would go to the shohat 
to the butcher and they, she would pick out a chicken. They would cut off the head, bring home the chicken, and then over the gas stove she would pull the pin feathers, pull off wow. the feathers, and then we would make up chicken soup and all of that. What, what about your, your other grandparents? What did you call them? Uh, Bobby Barnett. Oh, do you call them both Bobby? Bobby and Bobby. My my mother's parents were Bobby and Zadie, and my father's parents were Bobby Barnett and Zadie Barnett. Which ones were you just talking about? Bobby and Zadie, my mother's parents. Okay. You're always closer to your mother's parents. What about your father's parents? What can you tell me about the Barnetts? They didn't live so far away. Um, they were also serious people. I can't picture. I can't picture my father's relatives very much because. For some reason, they lived very close. We didn't see them very much. It was kind of like, I guess my mother was uncomfortable. I don't know. But we never really, we didn't have a big family, but it wasn't very close. So we would go see them. But like all events, if it was a holiday or something, it would be with my Bobby and Zadie, my mother's family. And my, my Zadie was a big deal at the temple across the street, the Morris Street Shoal, the Morris Street Shoal and Morris Street and my Zadie's house and everything, they were all destroyed in um, the whole street's gone in the riots in the 60s, the race riots in the 60s. Really? Oh, wow. So, so do you remember what your, what your Zadie Barnett did for a living? Uh, no, I guess I just think that what he did is I think he was I think everybody was a tailor when they came over, but I don't remember him doing tailor things. I just remember like sitting on the front porch and Sadie taking us. You know, we would go to temple across the street and learn Hebrew, uh -huh. learn the Aleph Bay. And then there was another temple we went to, and during the riots, somebody threw a stone and Sadie got hit in the head during the riots on his way back from Shul. Zadie Barnett or Zadie Zadie? Zadie, oh. not Zadie Barnett. Okay. Not very close to the Barnett, something like Did he have to go to the hospital? I don't know. I don't remember. Uh -oh. I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't there. I think we had already moved to New York then. We had moved to Long Island, me and my husband. Oh, oh I understand. Okay. What about, so tell me about your, uh, your sisters when you were young, growing up. What are your memories of, of Robin and, and Joyce and spending time with them? Um, I'm three and a half years younger than my big sister. Joyce. And they're both bigger than I am. I'm the little one in the family. I'm three and a half years younger. And I, um... I'm seven years older than my baby sister, Robin. And they're both taller, and they're both dark, and they both have wavy hair, or curly hair if it was shorter. And uh, they're both more serious than I am. And I know that I don't have many memories. I mean, Robin was born and I was three years old, but I do remember asking my father if he uh, didn't like me, why did they have to have another baby? Really? Yeah. What was your relationship like, thank you, with uh, with your mother and your father uh, when you were young? My relationship with my mother and father. Oh, you remember? Uh, my mother... So it's going to so well. Oh, yeah. It's oh. boring for a little kid. You want to come up here? This is my granddaughter. This is Abigail. She's, Want to say the hi? Older grand She's my older granddaughter. Say hi. Say hi. Right here. Right there by the camera. Say hi. So, <laughs> what was your question? Your relationship with your parents. My parents. My mother was, um, I discovered after she passed away and I looked in all these old photograph books, she was a very beautiful young woman. And my father, she had dark hair and wavy dark hair or curly dark hair. She, I think she always wore it kind of short. She was very beautiful. I never knew that. She was my mother, and she was never, she was my mother, and she worked hard. Oh, I forgot to answer. Um, for a while, she was a bookkeeper when we were young, and we lived on Morris Street. She was a bookkeeper for a while for uh, a man. I think it was, he was either a businessman. 
or an accountant. I'm not sure whether, or, or maybe for both of these people. I think the name was Brovitz. Brovitz. The accountant, Mr. Brovitz. Yeah, and I think he's he was around for a while. I knew. Him. I think he became. I think he was a client of my father's when my father it's was a stockbroker. I respected my parents. I think it was more a feeling of fear. And my father was out working, so when he was home, my mother, when he wasn't home, my mother would say, if I behave, if I behave badly, she'd say, if, um, or if she thought I was behaving badly, I'm going to tell your father and he's going to strap you. That's what they called it, a strap, and there was always this belt hanging up. Were you disciplined that way? I think I was really disciplined that way, but I think once my older sister was always trying to, she wasn't my best friend, and Don't so she would like anything is. I would do. She She'll be back. She'll be back, honey, in just a minute, okay? You want to sit on my lap with Safta? I'm Safta. I'm not Bubby and Zavi or Bubby. I'm Safta to my grandchild, my grandchildren. Um, who are we talking about? Uh, we were talking about your your sisters, oh, my your sisters. relationship okay, with them. Okay, so the big one, the, my big sister, Joyce, was mm -hmm. always trying to get me in trouble. So she would, like, tell on me. And one day, I remember it was a Saturday or something, and we had a TV, a black and white TV. And it must have been in the... We moved from um, my Zadie's house to Brighton in 1952. So... It had to be like around 1950, 1951. So um, I remember once my older sister, I think I, for some reason, somehow, some way, um, said, don't push one maybe of those hell, things. something like that. And my sister told my mother, my older sister did, and my mother, when she came home, I have a runny nose today. My mother, when she came home, ran and um, heard this and took me in this bathroom. It was one little bathroom, very old house, and the two bedrooms in the back. I'll tell you about that. And she took me into the bathroom and took a bar of soap and washed my mouth out with soap. And then I think lunch was, I don't know, but I don't know what it was, but I never ate that food again. Another trauma in my child. Oh, the younger sister, she did. She was a little Robin. baby. She didn't know. Robin. She didn't really know um, what was going on, so the two of them would kind of like, sounds paranoid, but gang up on me, so they would like try to get me in trouble or giggle, you know, tickle me until I giggled. My mother would always say, someone's going to be crying soon, someone's going to be crying soon, because everybody was giggling, and you know pretty soon that's going to happen. We lived, my parents lived in the front room, that was their bedroom, in the front room, and then you'd walk through their room to get onto the front porch, you'd enter into the living room, into this apartment, then there was the kitchen, and the two bedrooms, there was a bathroom off the kitchen, and the two bedrooms, mine and my older sister's, and we were in the backyard, our bedrooms, and behind us on Joseph Avenue was a kosher fish market, and uh, Bernie Oritz, who just passed away, he was, it could have been Oritz's then could have been Oritz's fish market and on Thursdays he would start smoking the fish for Friday making smoked fish and making lox and it used to be real hot well it still gets hot in the world but we didn't have air conditioning of course and up on the second floor the smell of the smoked fish would come in was that from down the street no it was from behind us oh, wow. our backyard back on Joseph Avenue which was a commercial Street, just like Clinton Avenue is. That's and Morris was, Street? Morris Street was our street, which was off Joseph Avenue. And Joseph Avenue is where they had Cohen's uh, Delicatessen upstairs, was my parents' wedding in 1939 um, in Cohen's Delicatessen. They had, um, but behind was this fish market and also golf. I think it was G U L F. Golf's. Um, it was kind of like a place. I know. I don't know what we used to buy there, but we'd go in. If we ever had a nickel, we'd buy a popsicle, usually a purple, a blueberry popsicle. I think they were blue. They were blue popsicles, and that was the big deal to get a popsicle. But anyway, on Thursdays, Bernie Orris would smoke the fish, make smoked fish, 
that awful smell, especially in the heat, would come into our bedrooms. To this day, I could be one of the few Jews in the world, or the few anythings, who doesn't eat smoked fish or lax. I don't even like smoked almonds. I don't like smoked cheese. I just don't, because of my childhood with a fish market. Okay. Um, was this the house that got uh, destroyed in the riots? Yes. The whole street's gone. Wow. Um, and that's the one that Bubby and Zadie also lived that's there? That's what they owned, yes. Okay. And they owned lots of houses, or...? I don't know about it, but they had some real estate where they had income. We, we lived closer to Number 9 School, which was on, on Joseph Avenue, Right, and our house was near the corner of Joseph and Monroe and, and Morris Street. But the better school, because we were in the city and it was an immigrant neighborhood where immigrants came in and the neighborhood was always changing depending who the new immigrants were. It was mostly Jewish at that time. And we moved, um, somehow our parents were able to get us to attend number 20 school. Number 20 school meant we had to walk to the other end of our street, Morris Street, and then cross, go down Clinton Avenue, I think, to Oakman Street. And um, it was a better school. It wasn't so many people who might, you know, it was with more people who maybe wanted to get an education and didn't act out that much. And I remember near my little school when we were little, we were only there, I think, second grade, in the, maybe early on in second grade, we moved to Brighton. But up until then, um, there was like a little penny candy place we go to right across from that school. This is what I remember. And there was somebody who asked me over to have dinner at their house, a friend, but they weren't Jewish. And we had a kosher house. And my parents made a big thing about, you know, they won't have kosher meat. Anyway, they made me hamburgs for dinner. It didn't taste like my mother's hamburgs. And I remember going in to use their phone to ask my mother to come get me because I was all upset about eating non-kosher meat. Kind of so weird. did you eat it? No. I left. Probably never friends with these people again, but not everybody in the neighborhood was Jewish, obviously. And was Morris, were there mostly Jews on Morris? Many Jewish people. Different immigrants. But mostly, yeah, a lot of Jewish people. Lots of weeds in the backyards and metal fences and front porches. And Are there other things you remember that you did for fun when you were... When you were a kid, you were mentioning the movies and such. Uh, what else did you that like was, to do? Well, that might have, the movies might have been after we moved to Brighton. The, um, my father was a big bridge player, and when he, um, he would play in bridge tournaments, the contract bridge, duplicate bridge, the card game, and he was very good at that. He didn't do much. He just did whatever he did well. So he was becoming a life master, and our trips, which is a, a great, a good um, position when you're a bridge player to be a life master, they call it. You get 300 master points. And it's, uh, I'm not a member of the ACBL, the American Contract Bridge League, because um, I don't think I'm going to live long enough to get those master points. But I did, um, I do play bridge now, probably not so well, but well enough, I think, and I enjoy playing. It's good for the brain. And I kind of emulated my parents playing. My father was always a better player than my mother. But my father would go to these bridge tournaments, and our trips, our holidays, our vacations, would be going to a bridge tournament, staying in a room house, and like fond memories when we were little. Our, the most wonderful times were going to um, um, a bridge tournament, staying at a rooming house in the Adirondack Mountains, like on Sacandaga Lake, I think it was. And if we were real good, we could buy a hot dog, a cherry pop, and I'm not sure if we got french fries, but that, oh, a popsicle. Hot dog, cherry pop, and a popsicle. And I always wanted to get by lunch, like almost immediately when I got there, because it was such a big thing to look forward to, and we had no money. So this was very exciting. Um, what do you remember about school? You mentioned you moved to Brighton. What was school like? It was scary moving. I don't remember much except that hamburger incident, non-kosher meat about, and walking, oh, walking to school back in um, Morris Street, walking to school there were so many chestnut trees and I would always 
walk on these chestnuts. I still think of them when I walk over chestnuts now, but there are many fewer chestnut trees. And we used to collect the chestnuts and try to bring home ones that were kind of open, the little pods for the chestnuts inside. Morris Street. Here in Brighton, school was tougher, and it was presented to me as such a, this is the best school, and it's number one school, and it's the best school, and you're going to the best, best, best. And so I was a little bit intimidated. I remember something in school that's really kind of stupid, but I hope you take this as cute for little girls when I'm gone. <laughs> I remember one question on a math test was, um, how many inches in a foot? And I wanted to get the answer right, so I kind of didn't do a good thing. I lifted up my desk. In those days, the desks used to lift up. I don't know what they do now. And you could like set them down where there'd be a little incline. I pulled out a ruler, and I measured my foot to see how many inches. So even with doing this not right and actually taking out a ruler to see how many inches in a foot, I measured my foot instead of a one foot length. <laughs> so there's a cute story from Safta. Also, I remember it was important to be accepted a lot. I didn't realize that Brighton was like one of these click places. I didn't know what that meant. So when I came in, I tried to be friendly with people. I was invited to parties, and it was really important to be accepted then at Brighton. So I studied and did it. It wasn't easy for me. My sisters, it was easier for them to do well at school. And um, I didn't realize until maybe recently that I have like a learning disability. I don't know what it is. Something about, it isn't really dyslexia, but it's something where I twist things around, which probably prevented me from doing well at math. I can handle things big picture. I can, I could, I can do a lot of things and I can, I'm very, I've had successful careers, but in school, this learning disability of whatever sort, I've, I've never really been able to explain it clearly to get an answer but I've been able to compensate for it my whole life until recently. It's been kind of an expensive learning disability, thinking that I'm choosing the right answer, and then after I hit that little computer, enter, send, then I realize, oh my gosh, I can't change this for another year, and I like cut myself out of uh, enrolling in a dental plan at a place I work, things like that. It's like my brain twists it around. So I did well, but not as well as my sisters who were very bright. So everybody went to Cornell. I was a Syracuse alum and went to Cornell on weekends for um, parties at Cornell kind of thing. Do you remember activities and interests that you had in high school? High school I was on the yearbook. My father was a big writer and I was proud when my son went to high school and especially when he was at Harley and learned how to write from um, uh, he had some very good teachers at Harley. I I wrote somewhat. I, I always emulated my father, the man with wavy blonde hair, and I really kind of take after his family more than my mother's family, I think. Um, Did you have any other interests, uh, activities in I high school? I was in the yearbook. Yearbook? I, I was on the yearbook. Um, I don't know if it's the committee, but I was one of the people, I think I was some kind of editor or something on the yearbook. I think I was on the uh, newspaper, the Did you trapezoid. Write? I wrote. The trapezoid? Yeah, the trapezoid, which our school was Brighton. I went to Brighton Elementary. There was no primary school when I was there, uh, but I was there in second grade anyway. And then Brighton High School before all the add-ons, and we were at... Uh, Witten, Elmwood, and Monroe, and if you looked at the streets, they formed a trapezoid. So I was on the trapezoid. Uh, so what about, uh, what made you pick Syracuse? Um, I, I don't know, I guess my parents kind of led us to think about schools in the Northeast, and I went to Cornell. I kind of wasn't even really keen on going to Cornell. Maybe if I tried a little harder at the, my sister was such a big, um, she was so successful at Cornell, and like the fourth day she was there, she met this guy who became her husband. They're still married, oh my God, and it's 19, no, it's 2014, and oh, she's still married to Peter. Met him the fourth day so at Joyce, Cornell, your older. Joyce, my older sister. Uh -huh. And I thought, holy cow, how am I going to duplicate that? So actually following in her footsteps to the same school and everything, I thought I would be 
I don't know whether I ever voiced this to my parents, but I kind of thought I would be um, held up to the same example. So it was just too difficult to follow in Joyce's footsteps. They weren't always stellar, but the ones that would matter, they wouldn't compare me to the bad things Joyce did. I had my own unique bad things that I was known for to my family. Like what? Okay. Yeah. Bad things. Um, Were you a troublemaker at all? or? I think kind of, I think as many people do, I think I made, um, I joked around because I think when we're, when we're little or when we're older or when we're even older mm -hmm. yet, we try to get attention mm -hmm. from people. Uh -huh. So I would be like uh, the person who would make jokes. I still make jokes, but it's, it's more part of my personality and I've kind of proven to my, even my own amazement. I've done things that if you had told me way back when I was in elementary school or high school, this is what you're going to do with your life and this is what you will have done and succeeded at or or by the time you're, holy cow, could I really be 69 years old? Um, I would say, no, nah, I could never do that. You know, she said, this is what your jobs you will do, this is the places you'll travel. I would never believe that I could do that. So what did you study in college at Syracuse? I thought it was important. Um, well, I got to Syracuse. I got there and I, nobody um. really told me what you do when you go to college. So all of a sudden everybody was going to register and someone said you really need to do this. So I don't know where I missed the part about what happens when you're accepted, yeah. but there I went and registered for classes, I don't know, general liberal arts classes, and then it got to be time to declare a major. And in those days women were either teachers um, nurses or social workers. It got to be new to be a social worker and it was in the uh, early 60s so I graduated, no mid 60s, I graduated Syracuse 67 and um, I thought I'd be a social worker. I wasn't keen on blood, still not. Um, teachers, um, I, I didn't have the patience. I think my, my mother was an impatient, I know she was an impatient person and my father was quiet and quiet and he was always there but he wasn't a noisy person he's oh another thing about my father the first year he was at George D.B. Beinbright he won a prize which was a year membership at a country club and then he he kept his business growing and maintained that membership at Midvale Country Club which was uh, mostly Italian, then they took in Jewish people when they needed money, then when the Jews needed money as things went on they brought in more Italian people. So it was a Jewish-Italian club. My father was a champion um, um, golfer there too and also very successful playing gin. He and my parents went there and danced. They loved ballroom dancing at the country club. But the thing about the club is it taught us, it kind of finished us off and it was a place that taught us how to behave with nice people and taught us about things like, you know, it was important to our parents to teach me, my sister Joyce, my younger sister Robin, to go to ballroom dancing school so we could dance at like the bar mitzvahs, the bani mitzvot, the uh, bat mitzvahs, the um, sweet 16 parties, wherever, and in, in life to know how to dance to know what forks to use, to kind of finish us off, to know about things which I kind of realize now that I'm later in life that a lot of people didn't have those advantages and all these really helped all of us know how to act and what to do. But you asked me something about why did I choose to be a social worker? Mm -hmm. I chose to be a social worker. Oh yeah, so I, my parents weren't very, my, fa my mother, who was with us most of the time, was not a patient person. So having children and being a teacher Although both my sisters have careers in education initially, was not something that I would, that I really wanted to do. I didn't have that patience. And I thought I wanted to help people, so I'll be a social worker. And I think now in retrospect that wanting to help people maybe was a way to having people, they'll like me if I help them. Maybe that was kind of my back door. If I help them, they're going to like me. I, you know, I don't care who you are or where you are, but that's kind of what I, I look back now and think. And unfortunately, I learned early on that people 
when I was a social worker, it just became, it just, the first year I was there at Monroe County, it became, it was called the Welfare Department. And then they moved to the new building and called the department the Department of Social Services. And that year is when the people who we were trying to help started to take over our building because they were entitled to have uh, winter coats every other year, but I wasn't. I didn't have enough money to buy a winter coat. Tough for me. I wasn't on social services. So this kind of colored my um, political views. I could be the only Jewish Republican in Rochester. But the, so they had more than you did? They were entitled, and I'm working for a living, and I'm not entitled, and then they started calling my house at Thanksgiving time. I, I was one of the newbies at the social services, so I only was allotted yeah. X number of turkey baskets where you, you can drop off to people's houses for Thanksgiving or Christmas, a basket with a turkey, canned goods. I only had such a, a small amount, so... You didn't have enough of them for all your clients? Oh, no, no, no. So I started to feel bad about this. They were calling my house. At that point, my husband had a job in New York. He was working for Merrill Lynch. I was still at home being a social worker living by myself in an apartment. In Rochester? And, in Rochester. And so uh, he was training, hoping to come back to, he, w he was training in New York, hoping to come back to Rochester and have a job here, but it never happened. We ended up with a job in New York, but that's later on. And so um, here, my mother and I ran down to Park Edge, which was a grocery store, bought some chickens and turkeys and bought some canned goods and tried to put together turkey baskets. And then we would drop them off for more people. And then more people wanted and Everybody was entitled. You spent your own money on this? Yes. So how long did you stay with the social services? Al, uh, Al and my husband uh, found out that he wouldn't be working in Rochester. He would come home every other weekend to be with me, his new wife. In um, He used to work for J.C. Penney and Company, and then he got a job working for Merrill Lynch in the back office. So he was started to work in Garden City. We had to relocate, so we got an apartment in Garden City. So I turned in notice at social services. When I went to New York, I tried to get a job in social services. What they had were some openings at like um, parole office where I'd need to carry a gun or something. <laughs> and so I went to this a little bit and uh, like some training and decided I didn't want to do that. I don't remember what I did on Long Island in the beginning and then I became pregnant shortly after I got there and I had my one and only child, Daniel, my son. So uh, you kind of skipped the part of how you met uh, your husband, Alan Greenberg. Oh, I didn't hear you ask me. How did I meet him? On a blind date. I think I met him on a blind date. Um, Were you still in college or? Yeah, on a blind date in college and I thought he was kind of a creep. So I didn't go out with him and he was kind of a big date. He took me by mm. his father had a pharmacy and uh, around the quite grew by there was my father's pharmacy, Greenberg's pharmacy. And he was kind of, you know, he wasn't a bad person, but, and then uh, there I was in college and I was coming up to the end of college, my fourth year, and somebody at the country club, Miguel Country Club said, I have this wonderful nephew and he's tall and he's dark and he's handsome and he just graduated college a couple years ago and he's got a good job, do you want to go out with him? So somebody fixed me up with him again, and it was Alan yeah. Greenberg, and he so was... So you didn't know it was going to be him yeah. the second time? I thought I'd give him another try. I don't know. I thought I'd give him another try. I'm always giving people another try, giving people, being nice to people, maybe mm. because other tries weren't that easy Oops. in my house to get. So, um, and he seemed like a nice guy, and he was thoughtful. He sent me cards mm. that he was thinking about me and stuff. And mm. he, it's funny, he used, and when he first pulled up, my parents lived on Clover Street, pulled up in his convertible, I think it was a Chevy or something, and he was wearing a sport jacket with a pocket scarf, my mother said, but then it was, he worked at J.C. Penney in those days, and you pull out the pocket scarf, and it was like 90% paper that you'd get from the dry cleaner, and then at the top would be like a, like an inch and a half of fabric. That's really? what he would, yeah, that was the thing that they wore then, so, but I guess it was dapper. And it was funny, you'd go to his parents' house, and they were all nice people, but you'd ring their doorbell and it would ring Hava Nagila, which always creeped me out a little bit. Really? We didn't come from that kind of, we were... Their doorbell was Hava Nagila? Hava Nagila, yeah, it was like, I. 
Yeah, it probably still is in Susie's house. If you ring the doorbell, it's probably Hava Nagila Hawaii. And so, um, and they were always very warm and loving, mm -hmm. but I don't know, I think they thought we were from Brighton and they were from Arandaquite. People had two roads when they left the city, That's the Jewish nice. people. They either went to Arandaquite. In our family. case, Brighton was the... If you could move to Brighton, you were really, you were really lucky, and that was the better area. That was always our perception, and that's where that's where I've been when I came back to Rochester, with my little family, Daniel and his and my husband Alan. We bought a house in Brighton, and I'm still in Brighton. Um, let's see. Uh, tell me about your your Jewish uh, uh, affiliations, like when you were. When you were young, did your your family belong to a synagogue? I always right? belonged to synagogues. I, oh, my Zadie was the Shamish, and I don't know what that means, but that was a big deal at the Moore Street Shul, and then, was it the Baden Street Shul? There was another shul not far. We used to, because we always walked to Temple, walked to Temple for the holidays and for the, the big holidays, not for Daily Minion, which would be the Moore Street, which was right across the street from my Zadie's house, but the and where we learned Hebrew. Um, but the uh, other shul, I wish I could remember the name, that was the big shul, maybe the Rhine Street, Rhine, R-H-I-N-E, Rhine Street shul, I think, and it had... So it was conservative or...? Oh, they were all Orthodox. Orthodox. That was not, that conservative came, I think, after World War II. There, everybody be, So your people, grandparents were, were Orthodox? Yeah. What about your parents? Were they... My, my parents were Orthodox. There was no conservative. I think after World War II became Reform, and then I think the backlash from Reform, because people didn't want to be known as Jews so much in America, especially the German ones, because the Jews were almost annihilated in World War II. That was uh, the horror of World War II, was, was eliminating the Jews, uh, racial uh, cleansing. Yeah. So, so you think that reform was created because of that? Yeah, but especially right, uh, German Jews in America didn't want to be thought of as those Orthodox Jews with the kippot all the time walking around and being so visibly in the talit. I don't remember, I think my Zadie had talit all the time and he was praying, but he was not with uh, the payas. Well, he, I think he was Mostly mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. He wasn't the Hasid. He yeah. wasn't a Hasid. But then, and then, so from the reform, the backlash to the conservative, my family was conservative. So we would drive to Temple. I still have a kosher house. I still don't eat pork. Um, although I think in college, for some reason, it was a big deal to have bacon. But that was short-lived. And I wouldn't eat pork or shellfish. I don't eat shellfish. Did you have a bat mitzvah? Sure. And it was orthodox? or? No, Temple Beth El, which was conservative. When we moved to Brighton, that was the temple to join. That was the conservative temple. And then they had bat mitzvahs on Friday night. How did your family celebrate Jewish holidays oh, when you were growing up? Like we do now. We would walk, well, we, then we walked to Temple, or in Brighton we drove to Temple, go buy a new outfit for Temple in school, usually a plaid dress for me, something big that would last a couple years. Um, shoes were always big. My mother went to school, to a uh, night school, to learn how to sew, made me coats that had big hems that would last for years, hems in the arms, hems in the bottom part that would last, um, you know, and lot, uh, because we didn't have much money until we could have money. But how did we celebrate holidays? You know, it was, oh, holidays were great with chicken soup and matzo balls and and whatever you do on all the holidays, we had that, and, and my mother would make um, hamantash, and my mother would make, or my Zavi would, for, my Bobby would, and Taylor, my mother would make, and she has all these old recipes that I guess now are online, and we've sent them on to Leah, all these old-fashioned recipes. Um, it was it was a lot of fun. The holidays were a lot of fun. They, the, the, the fasting, I remember, um, I couldn't write, and I remember once I was talking to a friend on the phone, and I realized you shouldn't even be on the phone on Yom Kippur. We were studying because the next day there was a test at school. Brighton was a, a Jewish area, so always, even now, there was no, um, school was closed on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah in oh. Brighton School District. 
because there are so many Jews in the area. Did your family have any special participation in at uh, in the Jewish community? You mentioned your your Zadie did, but like your parents were they involved? Was your no? We were always in sisterhood. Or? Father, I don't think was in men's club. He was not a big. Um, his family, they have they're in the Jewish cemetery on Lake Avenue. Uh, Robin knows the name of the cemeteries, and the Barnetts have a very big area there. They have. A big area uh, in that Jewish cemetery, the commissars in my mother's family have a much, well, they don't have an area, but for a while there was like a metal railing, um, this whole area that was reserved for the Barnetts and these big headstones, they're very, everybody was very stir, stern and serious. This is how I remember the people in the in, when they were little, but my parents, them, so my father was not especially observe it. I mean, he always, he was kosher, he wouldn't eat shellfish or anything. I don't remember my parents ever doing anything like that. Gosh, I can remember my first pizza. I can, you know, all these things that that were kind of strange for a time, they're not strange anymore. Um, uh, my mother, I don't remember her doing anything. They, they had parties on Brooklyn Drive in the backyard for their bridge playing friends and stuff, for their club friends, where they'd make, my mother always forgot the jello mold in the refrigerator. She always made a jelly. Always forgot that, but people would bring food. And then after everybody left, we'd find the jelly mold in the refrigerator. It's kind of a tradition. We didn't do it on purpose. So did, growing up, did your family have much interaction with the Gentile community or just Gentile? Jews? Gentile. Gentile. Um, it's funny. Um, it's, it's interaction. I think the fact that my members were, my family was members at a Jewish Italian country club, so they were exposed. My father was an account executive, not, and I think they, the Jewish community, I don't know about everywhere, but in Rochester is kind of odd. Sometimes they're talking to you and sometimes not. So we, there was never any doubt. We were always members of temples, always had, um, you know, we would have a bat mitzvah, we would always go to college. These were givens. There was never any question. Education was a big thing for us. My parents were never that involved. My mother probably more so because her mother was very orthodox. I don't think my father's family was, they were Jewish, but they were not especially observant. Uh, did you, you, you attend Sunday school, Hebrew school? Oh, right? Hebrew school, yeah, yeah, to you become remember, a bat mitzvah. Do you remember anything about it at all? I remember that I had Cantor Rosenbaum, and that Cantor Rosenbaum, he coached me on my bat mitzvah. Did I hear him? Yeah, I think you did too. And Gosh. I remember when um, I lost my father, that was the first person I lost in my family. And I remember in the minion, I saw him one day, and I thanked him, and I said, you taught me every prayer that I would need to know. For when you go to the minion, there are certain prayers like the Amida and stuff. And there was one prayer he didn't teach. Well, actually, two now that they do the Ashrei and Hashkiveinu. And I wish that I could say them. I guess now they teach you that when you become a, a bar mitzvah or a bar mitzvah. These are some of the things they teach you so that when you go to temple, you can just say them just like some of the other prayers that you learn that you can just say rote. Um, okay, so about, uh, you told me about your work as a social worker. Um, tell me about the other, uh, uh, I, I know deco plants. Was that the next thing that you did Oh, that's as a job? I'm not talking, not talking, but you can come and keep me company. Um, Let's see, in New York, um, Alan became disinvolved with uh, uh, Merrill Lynch, and so then we needed to find something to do, and I started working for this home party plan for uh, Ralston Purina. Yeah, it's been an hour. It has it been? Yes. Okay. Which is... Um, All right, give uh, me five minutes. Deco plants, and... Uh, Alan got a job with them uh, where he was traveling, and I um, I was working like doing party play just to bring in money. We needed money, and we had a house by then. We lived in an apartment in Port Washington, and then it became evident with Merrill Lynch we were going to be staying for a while in New York. So we bought a house in Plainview, and Daniel was born in Plainview. No, Daniel was born in Port Washington. When we lived there, he was born actually in Great Neck. So Ralston Purina ended up, they were opening up centers all over the country, and they were opening up in Rochester. And so 
they moved us back to Rochester. They paid for our move, and uh, we ran the um, facility in Rochester. Then Alan went traveling. I stayed in Rochester, ran things. Then they closed. Uh, then I went and got a job working for Howard Taylor and Company, which was secondary market mortgage broker investment banker. I didn't know what to do. He just said, here's a book. Read these papers. These are your clients. Start talking. And I was the oldest one of his people and um, the only woman. And I was successful there till he went bankrupt. And then I had many licenses uh, from Howard Taylor because we were selling securities too. So I applied for a job reluctantly at a wire service firm, the best in Rochester being Merrill Lynch. And they accepted me, which was odd because they didn't accept many women at all, nor many men either, but women were even fewer by number and more difficult to get hired. And um, I worked at Merrill Lynch for a while. Things got a little wild there. Uh, um, into the, after the savings and loan crisis in the uh, early 90s, that's when Howard, Howard Taylor went bankrupt, I started from 92, 80, uh, 92 to 96, no, I think it was 89 to 96. It was the 80s was the banking crisis. In 89 to 96, I was working for Merrill Lynch, and then I had an opportunity to work for State of Israel, uh, somebody, my friends, the Rappowitzes, recommended I get a job. Uh, they recommended me for State of Israel bonds. And I was the executive director for Upstate New York for State of Israel Bonds. Uh, by then, um, I had gotten a divorce from my first husband, and I was living on my own. My son was already out of the home at Syracuse University um, in the 90s, actually. We'll talk more again, but okay. let me just ask you some wrap-up questions. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, who are your role models? I guess my father was always my biggest. He was always quiet and always bright and always respected me. He had this great dry sense of humor and I just, it didn't matter. My mother, it was hard to ever please her. My father um, was the person who really mattered to me and for my father to be upset and to want to strap me, which I don't think he ever did, but for him to be upset with me. So he would be my role model. Okay. I would always want him to be proud of me. Do you have any other role models? or I can't think of my world. Was what there. are you most proud of? My son and my grandchildren. And uh, is there anything? My, my grandchildren are the world. I never thought I would have grandchildren. And I'm so grateful that Daniel found this wonderful girl, Leah, and that they have this wonderful family. That's the thing that I'm most grateful for him. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll talk again some other time, but thank you for uh, this interview. Sure. See, it wasn't so hard, was it? Oh, wow. We've been talking for a while. <laughs> I don't know how to stop this, but I'll ask her how to do that. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're that wasn't welcome. so bad, was it? No. Nope. Uh... Maybe she'll treat me to a Kleenex. Oh, yeah. I'm sure we can find one here. There are so many other things I wanted to tell you. Yeah, oh, we can do it again. So? Oh, we, well, we got to do more some other time. We don't know how to turn off the camera. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Just push that, got to, uh, that sign button.